is a box. I know, duh. Why are you listening to a TEDx talk about a box? Well, what if I told you that this box, in my hands right here, had the power to function as the unifying factor between all of us here today, while also working as the thing that breaks us all apart? Most likely, every single one of us, at one point or another, has experienced a moment of intimidation with this box right here. Whether it be an issue of being smart enough, attractive enough, wealthy enough, anything enough, we've all had that very human experience of feeling dissonant between whom we see ourselves as and the person we believe we need to be for others. A box. A societal norm, if you will. As an individual who identifies with the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, I felt a deeply personal relationship and battle with this box right here. In fact, I, like many, many other individuals, stumbled upon the diagnosis of autism much later on in life. Thus, the feeling of otherness was something that I never felt stranger to throughout my adolescence. However, instead of having that diagnosis to be able to explain that otherness, I suffered silently to myself instead, wondering that and just thinking that something was wrong with me instead. As a kid, I never flagged for any of those stereotypical symptoms that you see in an autistic child. I seemed to make fine eye contact. I seemingly did well in social situations. I definitely wasn't socially withdrawn. But what people didn't realize was that what I presented on the outside wasn't what existed on the inside. On the inside, I did struggle with all of these stereotypical symptoms of autism. I was just really good at hiding it. You see, as kids, all we want to do in the first place is to fit in. So when you exist so fundamentally different from everybody else and you have no explanation, you become obsessed with this. And that's exactly what happened to me. I became hyper fixated on learning how to be normal and I researched anything I could do to get my hands on it. How long to make eye contact with others? How much is too much eye contact with others? Small topics of conversation to bring up in small talk during awkward silences. I was a professional at being normal. And because of that, for a long time, I went missed. Unfortunately, at 16 years old, that feeling of otherness and constantly feeling like I had to be someone else for everyone else became overwhelming. So my parents brought me to a therapist to have someone to talk about that with. I left that therapy meeting with a recommendation from that therapist suggesting that I go to a psychiatrist to get a diagnosis of depression and potentially a medication for an antidepressant. And that was the beginning of it all. Over the course of the next six years, I visited countless amounts of psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, you name it. And with each visit, I left, either referred to someone else, diagnosed with something differently, or with a new prescription for another psychiatric medication. On and on and on, until I was left with a list of psychiatric diagnoses to my name and prescribed to take over eight psychiatric medications every single day. In the end, I didn't even feel that otherness anymore because I didn't feel like anything at all. All until one day, I stumbled upon a piece of literature talking about the late diagnosis of autism in women, and everything clicked. It's like the world shut down and I had found my answer. So over the next year and a half, I researched the diagnosis incessantly before even considering getting an official diagnosis. And what I found through the history, the assessment protocols, the neurology, is that a trend exists in late diagnosis of autism and missed diagnosis of autism in women, and not just women, but many other minority groups as well, such as non-binary folk and people of color. So you see, the current model that we have for making an autism diagnosis is not one built on inclusivity. In 2020, the CDC reported numbers that boys were four times more likely than women to be diagnosed with autism. This has severely skewed 
and biased the way that we have made our diagnostic assessments to assess people with autism, and it has preferred men over women, leaving them to fall by the wayside. <laughs> We've got research centers and publication after publication questioning for millions of dollars in grant funding whether autism is genetic and whether we can cure it when we don't even understand it. This kind of research is built on the belief that somehow autistic individuals are lesser than the general population and thus must want saved and cured. But matter of fact is, if you actually asked someone who is autistic what they wanted, they wouldn't tell you that they wanted changed. They wouldn't tell you that we, they needed to be something else for everybody else. They would tell you what they wanted was an inclusive society that existed to support and empower them rather than exclude them. We need to rethink the way that we view this diagnosis entirely. And we need to shift away from the belief that helping people with autism is curing them and remind ourselves and understand that the actual answer is to find out how this diagnosis affects every single individual in order to understand how we can better support them. Listen, I am not this box. That much is clear. And I'm okay with that now. But for a really long time, this object right here left me feeling defective, broken, born wrong. And there are so many other girls out there right now feeling exactly the way I do right now. Because the diagnosis of autism refuses to understand or acknowledge the existence of the female gender. So I'll leave you all here with this today. To all of those lost girls, just because the system has forgotten you doesn't mean I have, because I see you. And I will seize every single opportunity I can to highlight our collective story until the diagnosis of autism can be regenerated. Thank you.